Hello, and welcome to uh, another season preview with yours truly, Ryoga. Uh, didn't get to do one last season, because uh, normally I was doing the thing that I'd start doing in season previews where I watch a couple episodes, or an, an episode, of everything I want to watch, at, le uh, at least one episode of everything I want to watch. Uh, and then when I cover the season preview, I just talk about the episode, that way I have some knowledge of it. Um, but I was behind on stuff last season and just didn't get around to it. I was busy with the ReZero video. Uh, and it just got to the point where it was I felt it was too late to do a season preview and there was no real point. Uh, but now we're back. And I'm doing it before watching anything this season for two reasons. One is because, well, I wanted to record this earlier, but I didn't have the time. Um, but the uh, second is that I'm still behind on stuff from last season. And I don't want to start anything new yet. Uh, so I can force myself through all the stuff that I was supposed to finish, but haven't yet. Uh, but I'm making pretty good progress on that, so I should be able to start the new season pretty soon. Uh, so I went back to the research method where I looked up staff of shows and things like that. I actually did a bit more than I usually than I used to do when I did this, so uh, it should be interesting. Although, to be fair, this is a season with uh, fewer shows than the last couple. Uh, Winter usually has not too many shows, if I remember correctly. I think that's the usual pattern. It's usually... Yeah, because I'm pretty sure fall is the biggest season, and then winter it's just like the uh, the drop off where there's a lot uh, a lot less. Anime in general, there's more each uh, more each year, but uh, winter tends to be the lowest amount uh, in comparison to the others. Uh, also, there's a lot of sequels this season, and if I don't bother to do any of the research on sequels because odds are uh, you probably should watch the prequel or prequels of the sequel of whatever's airing before you watch that anyways, so there's no real point in me doing it because odds are the only people interested in watching it are people who saw the previous seasons, meaning they don't really care about staff stuff, because, I mean, well, it's probably the same staff anyways. Um, and if they like the show, they're going to keep watching it. Uh, but anyways, let's get into it. There's, uh, like I said, there's fewer shows, but I still want to get through all these, um, or at least most of them. Uh, so the first show we have is Choshonen Tantiden N.E.O., uh, Shonen Tenteiden is the title of both the 1937 novel by renowned Japanese mystery novelist Edogawa Rampo and the title of a series of Edogawa novels. The character of Yoshio Kobayashi appears in many of the novels as the young leader of the club. Kobayashi is the top apprentice of Kogoro Akechi, Japan's greatest detective and another, another character created by Edogawa. The story is set, in, set a century later in 2117 in future Tokyo. The battles between the detective Kogoro Kichi and the fiend with 20 faces from the original novels have now lasted through seven generations. Uh, so this isn't necessarily like an, a, a direct adaptation of, of a Rampo novel, if I'm getting this correctly. It's kind of like using his characters and then with a, like a liberal interpretation on them, which seems to be the case with all these shows recently that have been adapting Rampo's work is like none of them are strict like novel adaptations of his work it's like the characters he's done or like rampo himself taken in like a more liberal interpretation of a show or whatever um and uh i didn't bother to do any research on this though because the studio doing this is dle and uh while i could be wrong uh dle has pretty much been exclusively putting out a like two to five minute flash animation shorts for the last forever <laughs> so people who know dle know what they're in for here um, they, they're not, like, hated or anything, like, enough people like them that they keep doing these. Uh, I know they did Thermai Roman, or whatever the title of that one was, where, like, the old Roman dudes had, like, hot baths or something, or hot springs or whatever. I don't know, I didn't watch that one. Uh, I, what I watched was, uh, Nyaraku-san, because they did the flash shorts before the TV anime. Uh, those were fun. So, um... They've been doing those kind of like flash anime shorts for a while now. Uh, so I didn't bother to look up research on them because odds are you know if you want to watch this or not just based on if you've seen other DLE shows. Um, but yeah, also something I forgot to mention before I went into the show because I'm a genius when I don't have a script in front of me. Uh, since the last time I recorded something, which was uh, Saturday Morning Ramblings with Lewis last time, which we are going to get back to. Sorry, it's taking so long. We're having scheduling issues. Um, time zones are a bitch. Uh, so... Uh, I put up some stuff on the walls to help with the sound, uh, so it shouldn't, shouldn't it should, bleh, my word doesn't tell me trip over my own words any better, uh, it should sound better than before, not perfect, uh, I still have more stuff to do to fix sound issues and stuff, but, uh, it should sound better than the last recording at least, if you, uh, heard that, so, hey, uh, but anyways, back to the season preview, uh, the next show is I'm I Me Surgical Friends, which is, a, two words that sound very weird when put together, um, like, fucking doctors operating on each other or something. Weird shit. Um, 
like almost like a dark humor interpretation of like kids playing house or whatever or kids playing doctor i mean uh anyways uh it's a sequel to something choboranyam pomi some i mami shit i think <laughs> so well maybe it's not shit i don't know if people like this or not uh but anyways it, it's a sequel to whatever the hell that thing is that long title that i'm not even gonna try to read the whole thing of so odds are you know if you want to watch this or not uh so there's no point in me covering it uh and the next show is yet again a sequel <laughs> again we're gonna go all over a lot of sequels this season uh it's nambaka s2 uh, I'm pretty sure Nambaka literally just aired last season, so I think it's one of the rare shows getting a sequel that didn't actually take a break with, uh, because normally sequels like Iron Blooded Orphans last season, uh, Bubuku Baronki, they take a season off, and then they come back, so they have time to work on it, but I guess Nambaka just went right at it, um, maybe it's because, I don't, I don't know if is a full-length show, because if it's, like, half-length or something, that would explain why they didn't need the break, um, but I don't know what it is. I, I was planning on watching it when the season started, and then I just didn't care enough to get around to it, so I didn't pick it up. But anyways, uh, if you were watching that and you liked it, here's more. Uh, after that, we finally have a show that people might actually be interested in that isn't a sequel or a Flash animated short, which is Akiba's Trip the Animation. Akihabara is a neighborhood where anything is possible, where anyone can do seemingly anything, a place where you can lay bare your body and soul. In this neighborhood of Akiba, which has everything including anime, games, maids, idle secondhand parts, and cheap food, battles are fought against the Bagurimono, and a steadfast boy-meets-girl story begins. The original Akabi's Trip game takes place in a, re in a reproduction of Tokyo's Akihabara district where the player must fight vampires by tearing off their clothes and exposing them to sunlight. So in case you didn't notice by that little slip in the synopsis, although I assume they just ripped this synopsis from the game's website, it's based on a game. Uh, somewhat of a, not necessarily popular game, but when it came out, kind of got a bit of attention because of how weird it was where you fight vampires, because the idea is that, like, you're fighting all these people who are vampires, and they are weak to the sun, so you take off all their clothes, and then the sun kills them. Um, makes sense when you think about it, but just funny and amusing when actually put into practice. Um, especially because, you know. Um, so this is being done by Studio Gonzo, who have been on their death throes for a while now, but has refused to fully die. Uh, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, because I actually, uh, recently they put out, for example, Sorga Seiyu, which I actually liked quite a bit. Um, they're almost doing better work now that they're in their death throes rather than beforehand. Uh, I think it's like a desperate last attempt to stay afloat, because Gonzo has not been doing well lately. Um, but, uh, yeah, this is, this is a weird, weird game. And we, and people know how game adaptations tend to go in anime, but you never know. I heard from the people who watched the first episode of this that it's very strange. I mean, what's shocking about that? But, uh, I don't know if it's how similar it is to the game, because I don't really know anything about the game other than the basic premise. But people are saying, like, it's weird in a way that it knows it's weird and kind of goes with it so it can work, uh, in that kind of, like, humoristic, self-deprecating sense in a way. Um... So, there's that. Um, as far as uh, staff stuff that you could care about, um, the uh, director who did Sorgaseu with Gonzo is doing this show too. Um, the staff are probably getting more inclusive as they're doing their death throws again, as I said. Um, the person doing the series composition for this did Relife. Uh, people liked that, although to be fair, Relife was based on a manga, not a game, so that could just be the strength of the original material talking. Uh, it's always hard to say when it comes to adaptations. Um, kind of ironic that uh, when people do script or series composition for adaptations of stuff, it's really hard to tell how much of the quality was their doing because the original work could be carrying them. Uh, you, you never know because uh, when something sticks to the source material, it's either like, oh, it was a good call to do that because the material was good or it was a bad call to do that because the material was bad or... Maybe they wanted to do something but failed at it. And, and it's almost impossible to tell the quality of a script or uh, series composition person on a show that's doing an ad adaptation unless they go, like, really liberal with it. You know, they, like, almost get almost a, a anime original. Then you can start judging them. It's almost hard to, to say otherwise. I'm talking in circles. But <laughs> point is, it, he did real life, but it doesn't necessarily mean anything. Um, more interesting is that a bunch of new voice talent is doing this show. Um, for example, funny enough, uh, as you can see in the promo image the, with the three girls, uh, the main three girls are being voiced by the same main three girls that did Sorga Seiyu. Uh, and the funny thing about Sorga Seiyu, if you didn't watch it, but you should, because it was cool, even though people called it a Shirabako ripoff, even though the 
webcomic that Jasora Garcia was based off started way before Shirabako. It's just one of those things where some when something's popular, it's like seen as the first of whatever it did, regardless of whether it actually was, because the things before it weren't popular enough to get recognized. Kind of like how everyone thinks Overwatch started like hero-based arena shooters, even though it didn't. But, uh, you know, that, it's one of that popularity thing. Uh, anyways, point is you should watch Sarah Gaseo, because it's actually pretty good. Um, especially if you're interested in voice acting. Uh, but yeah, the main three girls who did the voices behind that uh, are doing this. And Sorgasia was almost kind of realistic in a way because the main three girls were brand new voice actresses other than the main girl, Futaba, uh, who's voiced by Takahashi Rei. She had a couple side roles beforehand, ironically, in Shirabako. Uh, maybe that's where they scouted her. Uh, they saw her, like, side roles in Shirabako. They Because they probably wanted someone... I mean, they could have gone with a brand new voice actress for, for Sorgasia, but they were kind of like... They saw Shirabako, had, which was going for a similar thing, and they're like, why don't we just choose someone who did some, you know, really minor side roles in that to be the lead for this, as a newbie Seiyu trying to, trying to make their way in the world. Uh, I think it worked. Uh, but anyways, um, though they have all had varying amounts of success, some of them, uh, namely one of them having very few roles in Soraga Seiyu, another getting a couple, and Takahashi Rei, again, who did the lead, uh, doing exceptionally well for herself, because since Sora Gaseyo, she went on to do, uh, everyone's favorite Megumin in Konosuba, uh, and then followed that up with Amelia from ReZero. So, those are the kinds of, like, follow-up roles on each other, where it's like, oh yeah, <laughs> she's set, she's gonna be in the next, I don't know if she'll be the next AAA voice actress, but it's not too unsimilar to how people like Kana Hanazawa exploded into popularity by getting really popular main character roles, and then they just got in everything after that. So don't be surprised if Takashi Ray starts appearing in fucking everything from now on. Um, but yeah, uh, funny enough, it's not just the girls though. Uh, the main dude, uh, it, while not brand new, it's his first lead role. He's only done supporting roles before this, and not too many of them. So uh, uh, the dude's name is Haruki Ashia. I wrote that down. Uh, so... It's always interesting when dudes, because, you know, with anime, there's a shitload of female characters, because it's anime. So, it's not uncommon to see new female voice actresses trying to break into the mold, but not too often you get to see a new du uh, a new male voice actress, so that's actually pretty interesting. Uh, although, like I said, he's not brand new. Uh, so, if voice work stuff is uh, your type of thing, this also is something you might want to keep your eye on as far as seeing how that goes. Uh, it's part of the reason I actually want to watch it. I don't expect too much quality-wise from the show itself, but I want to see the... I want to see the VA blood. I want to see how they do. Um, so, there you go, though. Yeah. Pretty much, I guess, unless you really liked the game, then you might want to watch it. <laughs> but as far as I'm aware of, people like the game for its silliness, but they don't think it's anything actually great or anything. They just think it's amusing. Uh, but yeah. Uh, following that up, we have Masamune Kun no Revenge, which is pretty easy to translate. Revenge of Masamune or Masamune's Revenge. It's pretty simple. Anyways, uh, as an overweight child, Makabe, Makabe Masamune was mercilessly teased and bullied by one particular girl, Adagaki Aki. Determined one day to uh, determined to one day exact his revenge upon her, Makabe begins a rigorous regimen of self improvement and personal transformation. Years later, Masamune reemerges as a new man, handsome, popular, with perfect grades, and good at sports. Masamune, hmm? Wait, what is, why is that in? Masamune transfers to Aki's school and is unrecognizable to her. Now Masamune is ready to confront the girl who bullied him so many years ago and humiliate her at last. But will revenge be as sweet as he thought? So it's one of those, I won't say cliche, but it's one of those uh, kind of typical romance setups where it's like antagonistic that buds into romance, which isn't a bad thing. It's actually a, a pretty solid way to take a romance story. It doesn't have to be a literal revenge story, but just the idea of like people not, you know, people butting heads with each other and then developing into romance. They tend to be the more interesting romance stories because it's easier for development to happen there as far as, like, they respect it. Like, it, it's it's more interesting to see people not like each other and then get respect for each other rather than when they just start off with infatuation to begin with. It's why, for example, one of the reasons Toradora is so great because, uh, you know, they don't necessarily view each other romantically at first and then it grows from there. Um, so it, it's a good idea uh, or it's a good approach to take with that kind of stuff. From what I've heard of, of people who read this manga, it's actually pretty amusing because a lot of the people, the main character, the main girl, side characters, a lot of people in the story are really shitty. Like, not badly written shitty, but like, they're just bad people. Like, they're really vain. 
So, I mean, the whole premise is that he gets attractive and then Alton, you know, he, he's going to get fucking revenge on her and, like, he's popular because he's now attractive, you know? So it's about a bunch of vain people and it, like, knows that it's about a bunch of vain people, so it kind of plays with that. Uh, and from what I've heard, it actually pl takes it in some interesting character development directions because it knows what it's doing. Uh, so definitely something to keep an eye on. Uh, as far as research did, um, I did more than just staff. Like I said, I did more research uh, this season than I usually do. For example... Uh, I looked up adaptation stuff. This manga has been running since October 2012. Uh, it is still ongoing. Uh, so something to keep in mind is that because it's still ongoing, it'll either have a cliffhanger, which is definitely possible, or just unresolved because it's burning since October 2012 and it's a manga. So there's a lot of material to work with. So odds are they'll just reach a certain point and then just call it quits or maybe do a second season, try and adapt as much material as they can. Who knows? Um... Although keep in mind, there are some times where a show starts airing and then halfway through its airing, there's an announcement that comes out that says the manga's ending soon and it's going to coincide with the anime. So keep in mind as I go over these shows that have manga that are still currently running that there may come an announcement that they're going to coincide their ending with the anime. It happens sometimes. Um, but anyways, uh, the director who's doing this mainly did work on Fate Ilya stuff, uh, which is a weird choice for something like this, but hey. Uh... He was the, the, for, I mean, he was the chief director of the first season of Ilya, uh, and along with the OVA, and then he's done episode directing and storyboarding just in general with the series. Uh, I don't know about Beyond Fate Ilya. Uh, he's done a couple things Beyond Fate Ilya, but nothing too recognizable that I wrote down, so, like, the main thing you'll recognize, uh, with this guy is that he did Fate Ilya, so. Uh, maybe I should do the, the full title, like, Fate, it's like Fate Prisma Ilya something, I don't know, whatever. Um. Interesting choice, but again, people do lots of different types of works. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean they can't do lots of different types of works. Sometimes they can't, but just something interesting to note. Uh, more interesting is that there's two script writers being credited on this. Uh, the first one did a script and series composition f uh, work for, for example, Bin Bogami Ga and Servant X Service or Servant Cross Service. I don't know when it comes when it comes to X's in, J in Japanese. They either are literally X or they're cross, so it's always hard to say. Um, which is kind of weird. Those two shows seem like they wouldn't really fit here because they're uh, largely comedies as far as more. I watched Bimbo Gamiga, but not Servant uh, X Service or Servant Cross Service. So I don't know how much of a comedy that is. I think it is. Um, but uh, those are the, it's weird because those shows have like, I won't say they're cult classics because they're not that popular, but the people who liked them enjoy them for the most part. So uh, that's interesting there. And the second script writer is uh, Michiko Yokote, who I wrote down his title because it turns out he's done fucking everything. I mean, not literally everything, but for example, here's a list of some stuff he's done. Bleach, C Cubed, Dagashi Kashi, Gintama, and Gintama Apostrophe, which is the sequel. Hikari no Go, Nabari no O, Naruto, Prison School, those are weird to put together, Red Data Girl, Seko Boys, and probably many others that I didn't bother to write down. Well, I mean, I know there's many others I didn't bother to write down, but I just put down some of the most noted, notable ones that you could recognize. So, very weird list, all over the fucking place. It doesn't really mean much, because it's like, you can't really nail anything within that spectrum. It's like, what the fuck? What do I even do here? So, it's just more, inter it, it, to go with the beginning, it's, it's, he's done work on everything. Oh, I should also mention, uh, I'm retarded and worded my notes weirdly, but, uh, he also did series composition work on the entire Genshiken series. So, there you go. Even more stuff he's done. Uh, but yeah, that is, it, like I said, it's just interesting that there's two writers in general. One who's done just a couple things, and another who's done, like, shitloads of stuff. So, very odd, but, hmm, something to just keep in mind. Uh, but like I said, just because of the general premise I'm interested. Although, I will be honest, uh, Silverlink's doing this, and they have been on a bit of a downward tread lately. Uh, although I think Silver Link's the one that's been doing Prisma Ilya, so I guess that's where they got the director from. Uh, but I haven't cared much for the shows they've been doing lately, which is a shame, because I liked them when they first started off as a branch of Shaft. Because uh, Silver Link branched off Shaft. One of the first... I, mean, I don't know if it was the one of the first shows they did, but one of the first shows that I watched that I remember very well was uh, Bakket Test. Uh, and you could recognize a lot of the Shaft influence there with like the random like coloring and stuff, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, and it seems like they've been kind of losing that style over time. They've just been getting kind of generic. They've been losing their energy. It, it's a shame because I liked Silverlink before, but it seems like they're just kind of losing their edge. Uh, but they could always bring it back. Who knows? Um, I'm interested enough in the show itself to watch it. Um, that's for sure. Uh, next show is Urara, Meri uh, Urara Mericho. 
the story is set in Medu Me Merocho. Medocho? I don't know. A town where all female diviners, Uranaishi, live and where girls from all over the country yearn to become the top diviner, Urara. Today, a solitary girl named Chia enters the town's gates. Excuse me. However, she has another purpose coming here. Besides becoming the Urara, Chia's days as an apprentice diviner begin as she meets three friends. The Ernest Kon Kome, who is a fan of Western culture, and the shy Nono. No, no, what a name. Uh, so yeah, this is kind of like the, probably one of those like not much happens feel good shows with a bunch of cute lolis. Odds are, if you're a serious loli fan, you know what you're in for here. Um, I don't, I haven't seen impressions for people who watched the first episode, so I can't really say anything in that regard, but it seems pretty obvious that that's what this is. Um, it's being done by JC Staff, the studio who loves to milk on things that are popular, so <laughs> it wouldn't be too unsurprising if that's the case. Uh, as far as notes I took, the manga for it has been running since April 2014, so a couple of years, 2014, 2015, and 2016. Um, I don't know if it's based on a four coma or not, so who really knows. Uh, the director for this did Hentai OG and Shimaneta. Uh, while also doing storyboard and episode directing for just a bunch of random stuff. Um, that is a, well, I was about to say it's a weird, Hentai Oji and Shimaneta were a weird combination, but then I started to think about it and it was like, there's actually some connections there I can make sense of. Um, didn't care much for Hentai Oji, although Shimaneta was a lot more fun, in my opinion. Uh, directing wise, I, I can't really nail down anything with this director, so that might kind of fit though for a show like this where not much happens, so hey, there you go. Uh, person doing series comp, uh, series composition, uh, I wrote down their names, so they must be important. Uh, Hitomi Miyano, uh, has done tons of similar genre works. That's why I wrote it down. She's done a bunch of, uh, similar genre works, uh, in the same vein. Uh, To List a Couple, Amanchu, Erotama, uh, and Flying Witch. Uh, so, there you go. Uh, below, I also wrote that she did, uh, Snow White with the Red Hair and both seasons of Noragami. Uh, and that's the person who did series composition stuff. So, um, hey, it's, uh, I, I guess that fits, you know, when, when uh, I said before series composition, it's kind of hard to nail how much influence they have, but if they work on all very similar style shows that have about the same reception, it's like, yeah, I can see it. Weirdly enough, Flying Witch was the first kind of like low down, not much happening show that I actually liked, but I think it was just because the students were actually like in or the characters were actually like or at least the main characters, were really actually in college, and, like, it was easier to relate to them rather than a bunch of, you know, little girls. Um, but who knows? Maybe maybe it was just the directing, but uh, I don't know. Uh, something else I noted is that the uh, the main... Why did I write... <laughs> so, so, basically, there's a new voice actress on this show, although she's not brand new. Uh, I wrote in her name, Sayaka Harada. Her only previous work was Tawaba on Monday as the lead girl in that. That's literally the only other thing she's done. And I needed to write down the character, but I thought, I, I guess I thought putting down the name wouldn't make sense because you wouldn't know who's who at this point unless you've seen the show. So my descriptor I put is main weird girl. Wow, that helps you remember who the fuck I was talking about when I wrote that. Probably the white haired chick with the red ribbons, if I had to guess. Um... But maybe if it could be looked up again, although it just seems like it makes sense to be her. Uh, she is just brand new. Just something to keep in mind for if you want to get, if you, if you're someone like me who likes to keep an eye on uh, VA stuff. Not sure if I care enough about this show to give it a shot <laughs> to, uh, to hear the, the uh, new voice actress, but maybe I'll watch clips or something. Um, after spending an insane amount of time on that show, uh, let's move on to the next one, which is Sidon. Uh, Shoichi Kamida is an ordinary high school boy who is faced with university entrance exams and worries about his future. This campus romantic comedy, Seiden, uh, which apparently means honest in Japanese, depicts his pure relationship with three- I like how they said pure relationship. Pure relationship. No hand-holding. With three different heroines. Each story is the unique and mutual memory between him and the heroine. I'm not sure what they mean by depicts his pure relationship with three different heroines. I guess it's like one of those what if scenarios where it does like three different routes. Like it goes down one route and then it like time resets to a different chick or something like that. So it's like omnibus, but it's not actually based on a visual novel. So it doesn't mean anything. I don't know. Uh, I wrote down some stuff. Uh, something you may notice just looking at the promo image. Uh, the character designer of this did Amagami. So you can see the connection there pretty easily. 
Um, he did the designs for this show, uh, along with the series composition for it, which is the first time he's done anything outside of character design, or she, I don't know if it was a he or who it is, so I'll say they. First time they've done anything outside of character design, so first time they're actually, it says, I mean, they're listed as series composition, not script, but there wasn't a script credit, so I'm guessing he also wrote the, or they wrote the script, uh, so... It's their first time writing anything, so it would be interesting to see it in that regard, although it could just end up being a giant piece of shit, so who cares? Um, the director for this, oh, brace yourself for this, did a comic a kill and hundred legendary, well-renowned shows. Um, but funny enough, I know I was going over this guy when I was covering hundred in the other season preview. I also didn't deign to mention uh, that they also did storyboarding and episode directing for Monster. <laughs> So if you've ever wanted whiplash on a, on how to feel about someone, there you go. Uh, a further example of how directors or pretty much any staff on any uh, position can do both good and bad works. Uh, although, again, being the main director is very different from being a storyboarder or an episode director. But still, the point is, staff members can do any number of things. I'm just doing this because... Uh, I forgot to mention the spiel in regards to this. The reason I mentioned staff members is not because I'm guaranteeing you what's going to be good or what's bad, but just to, to give you an idea of what you want to try and pick up if you're not going to watch fucking everything. And in an ideal world, you'd watch everything and then decide in and of itself what's good and what's not, because that's the only way you can really determine if a show's good or bad is by watching it. Um, but we don't have enough time in the world to watch all the anime coming out, so we have to make educated guesses based on information. And one of the most obvious pieces of information to base guesses off of is staff members. So that's why you do it. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's Sarah. And I didn't write anything else. It's original work. So there wasn't much else I could find other than like whoever wrote it and was directing it and stuff. Um, uh, if I don't mention anything about voice actors or voice actresses, because I did look for every show, it means that they're just either, it means that they're just standard voice actors. Like they've done quite a bit of stuff. You probably know who they are if I gave their names off. Um, I only mentioned voice actors on the shows if they're like AAA voice actors or if they're brand new or almost brand new because those are the ones to notice. Uh, but anyways, moving on to the next show. Uh, Yojo Senki. The story centers on a young girl who fights on the front lines in war. She has blonde hair, blue eyes, and nearly transparent white skin and she flies through the air and mercilessly strikes down her opponents. Her name is Tanya Degoruchov. I probably mispronounced that. And she speaks with young girl's lips and commands the army. Tanya used to be one of Japan's elite office workers, but because of a wrathful god was reborn as a little girl. Tanya prioritizes optimization and career advancement above all, and she will become the most dangerous entity among the Imperial Army sorcerers. So something to notice is that uh, this is being done by a brand new anim animation studio that's breaking out. Uh, they're called Nut. What a name to choose. Uh, but they are brand new. I checked. They haven't done anything else unless they just weren't credited on anything else they've done, which I'd imagine would only be very, very minor work if they didn't get credit. Uh, so this is their first full-length show breaking out into the, into the fold. Uh, something to note is that the promo image might be, uh, like a turnoff for some people. That's like a weird promotion image because it's like a fisheye lens picture. The, the character models do look slightly different from usual stuff. Like we just covered Saren, that's your generic anime model. These are, these are a bit different. The heads are kind of a bit bigger, more like wide-ish in a way. Um, but it is a fish eye, it, like, it is the art in general in the show, but it's a fish eye lens distortion of it. Uh, so keep that in mind, like, not, she doesn't look like that in general. It's just the weird promo image they, they have. Um, the, the fish eye lens is to show how, like, weird she is, because, like, the whole point is that she's evil as fuck, and, like, gonna do a bunch of bad shit, which is interesting. It's fun to watch people be evil. Well, sometimes it's fun. It depends on how it's told. Um... But yeah, it's based on a light novel that's been running since October of 2013, which is a decent amount of time for a light novel to not get cancelled. Uh, so it seemed it's probably doing at least decent. Um, I also noticed as I looked up the light novel that the author of that uh, has one other light novel that they've done. And it's also a political one. So this isn't like some weird one-off where they like write about little girls and they just found an excuse to put them in this. Uh, their other LN that they're doing, and I'm pretty sure it's still running, is extremely political. It's about, like, five different factions and, like, arguments about socialism and shit. You should look up the covers. I didn't write down the name because I'm an idiot, but the, uh, 
just look up Yojo Senki's light novel and the author and the other light novel that they're doing. And uh, the covers are actually really cool. They're like these uh, red and black stylized covers. Like, they look mature as fuck. Like, they don't, they look like they don't belong in light novels at all. So that's, I, I wrote that down because it was interesting. It like, is like, it seems like their main interest is political stuff. Like, I mean, there's that and then there's this. Someone who's fighting in the war and trying to make their way, uh, work their way up and like is a fucking bastard in the process. Uh, which makes me more interested in this because if it was like, oh, they wrote Yojo Senki and then their other spinoff was like something along the lines of Rado Medicho, it would have been like a one fucking like spinoff thing where they're like, eh, fuck it, I'm just going to write about little girls because that's the only thing that sells. Uh, which is always a possibility for why that's the case, but, um, I've seen some screenshots from the first episode, and boy, does she look evil as fuck at times, so that's cool, um, but yeah, just something to, to keep in mind for, as far as the author goes, uh, more interesting for me is that the director for this did, uh, Dentalian no Shoka, uh, a pretty good show that I, a lot more people should watch, because it's pretty rad, it has one of the best openings ever, uh, it is neat, a uh, very stylistic choice of music. Um, but, uh, Dantelian, I'm just, I'm just going to rant a little bit about Dantelian no Shoka because no one fucking watched it. Um, uh, it translates to something like Library of Dantelian. Uh, it's pretty good. If, even if you just watch a couple episodes, you should at least watch what I call episode 3A because the, I don't know if all the episodes did it, but I know episode three was split into two halves. Like one, e uh, each half told a different story. 3A was like one of my, is still one of my favorite, uh, bits of anime that I've watched. It, it was extremely similar to something you see out of fucking Kino's Journey. The show in general is kind of similar to Kino's Journey. It's basically like they have to find these different books and they're about different things and they end up in different people's hands. Um, and it, and it, it's not always philosophical, but it focuses on like these different concepts of each book and like what's going on with that. Uh, like I said, 3A was my favorite. Uh, it actually, I was actually really surprised by how it ended. Uh, it made me think for quite a while. I liked it a lot. Uh, it's not perfect. It ends on like, it starts ramping up near the end and then, you know, ends and then obviously isn't getting a second season ever. <laughs> so that's a shame. Uh, but yeah, Dentalian Oshoka, side recommendation. Something you want to watch if you have time. Uh, anyways, as I was saying, the director did uh, for this did Dentalian Oshoka and they also did Punchline, which I really liked. Uh, and not a lot of other people liked, but that's okay. I understand why people wouldn't like it, but you're wrong. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I couldn't help myself. I was thinking about saying it. And I was like, nah, I shouldn't. And then I said it anyways. Um, but yeah, those are two shows I... what it, Two different shows that like don't have massive popular appeal, but I liked quite a bit myself, which leads me to believe that there's, again, while staff don't necessarily mean anything, percentage-wise, there's a higher chance of this being the kind of show that I like uh, because the director's done stuff that I'm... that I find interesting. Um... And something to note as far as the voicing stuff is that the main girl is voiced by Aoi Yuki. Uh, people really like her. She's done a lot of cool stuff. Um, I think one of my favorite roles she's done was the lead Victorica in uh, Gothic. God, can, a, can an NA license company please rescue the Gothic anime license from Purgatory? That's the only thing I want with my life. Okay, it's not the only thing, but it would be very nice if that li license could get rescued. Because Bandai licensed it and then they died. So the Blyces just went into purgatory. They never released the show. I don't know if it's still in purgatory, but like no one picked it up after that because the show had finished airing and no one was talking about it anymore. So it was like, well, shit, son. Like, now what? I, got, I just want to buy Gothic on DVD or Blu-ray or whatever. Come on, man. Um, but anyways, uh, and then there's another character I picked up. I think it was the only other female character I saw on the list. was voiced by Saori Hayami, uh, another very popular AAA voice actress. Uh, the other dudes were less recognizable, mainly because they were, like, older military dudes, but they also had the older voice actor team on the, uh, on the team. Like, they, I remember, I noticed that they did other roles that had, like, you know, the kind of gravelly old dude kind of voice, the super serious stuff. So, it looks like casting-wise, Yojo is also very, very good. Uh, and I also wrote that the opening, uh, for the show, at least I think it was the opening, I tried to triple check over the opening or the ending, and I'm pretty sure it's the opening, is being done by Mythenroid. Uh, who, if you remember, did the first ending and the second opening. So, first ending, second opening for ReZero. Uh, if you watched it, they also did the ending for Bubuku Baronki, and probably more popularly, they did that ending for Overlord that was really rad. Um, so, they put out some pretty fucking good music that I like. So, Yojo Senki's looking like a pretty good watch on my list. Uh, as far as everyone behind the show, it seems lined up to, at the very least, be enjoyable for me to watch. I don't know if I'll, like, love it, but 
with the kind of information I found on the show, it's like, oh yeah, I'll probably enjoy this. So, uh, unless the show just itself is a big pile of shit, then who knows? But, uh, yeah, looking pretty good for me. I'm, I'm looking forward to watching it when I get the chance, which means I need to finish watching shit I'm behind on, which I'm going to go over as fast as I can. Um, next show we have, I'm going to try and go through these a little quicker because I'm taking a little too much time. Uh, next show is Fuka. The story centers on a young man named Yu Haruna who has just switched schools. He's a bit shy and he's constantly glued to his smartphone so he can check Twitter. Sounds like me. Not really. I'm barely on Twitter. <laughs> I just get an idea for something and then I tweet it. I'm a very frequent titter. Twitter. I said titter. Wow. It used to be easy to follow though. Don't spam your fucking dashboard. Anyways, I'm getting off track. I said it was going to go faster. He meets a girl named Fuka Akatsuki who doesn't even have a cell phone, is free-spirited, and naturally fascinates others. Yu recently has been getting back in touch via Twitter with his childhood friend, Koyuki Hinashi, who is now a popular singer. One day, Yu invites Fuka to one of Koyuki's concerts, and there the three meet for the first time. The story follows the love triangle between a love that started through electronics and a love that didn't start through electronics. Wow, what a way to word that. So interesting. Um, Dio Media are doing this, who've been okay recently. They do some not-so-great stuff, but then occasionally they put out a show that's actually not bad. Um, they're kind of on the, like, back and forth on that regard. Uh, this is adapting a manga that's been running since February of 2014, uh, which is not a long time, but, you know, decent amount of time. Uh, I've actually heard some people talk about this as far as the manga, and, uh, I don't know if it's, like, necessarily... I won't say anything, but uh, I don't know if it's in spoiler territory or anything. Some of the stuff that I heard people mention, like, kind of vaguely, but... This seems like the show that is not necessarily going to be the most popular watched thing or anything. Uh, but might be the most talked about. <laughs> and not in a sense of getting people to watch the show because they want to talk about it. Like, that was kind of ReZero in that regard. Everyone was talking about ReZero, so people started picking it up. Um... This is the kind of show that's going to be talked about and everyone's just going to be confused <laughs> from the things I've heard, if what I heard was right. Uh, so that should be interesting. Uh, the author for this did uh, Kimi no Irumachi, uh, which translates to A Town Where You Live, uh, and something called Suzuka before that, which I looked up and had a decent amount of members having watched it, so I figured I'd list it to mention that the author did those. Um... The director for this did the first season of Dog Days, along with both seasons of Sekire, uh, or Sekire. Uh, he also did Inukami, which is one of my favorite comedies I've watched, and it's really fucking old, like 4 by 3 ratio old. Uh, if you like really weird comedy, like people hip-thrusting lasers out of their dicks, <laughs> not literally, it just comes from the crotch, then Inukami is the kind of comedy you want to watch. It's very weird. Uh, not necessarily perverted, it's just... It's not like perverted or sexual, it's just like kind of sexual in nature of the jokes, because there's like a lot of crotch jokes and stuff like that. So if you like that kind of stuff, you should watch Inukami, one of my favorite old school comedies. I'm not sure if it's really old school or not. I just saw it old school because again, Verisha was like four by three. It was fun though. It actually got pretty serious near the end. It was interesting. Anyways, I'm getting off track. Series composition for this, uh, Fuka is being done by uh, a guy who did some episodes of Konosuba, Arslan Senki, and Rampo Keaton. Uh, but is also, interesting enough, doing the story for a novel called uh, Nogi Wakaba is a Hero, which is a spin-off slash prequel to Yuki Yuna as a Hero, which is interesting. It's weird that a uh, person working on a novel or a light novel or a manga, because I, I said novel, but I'm pretty sure it's a light novel. Uh, someone working on a light novel or a manga is doing series composition or script writing for, sh for an anime. That's actually interesting. I mean, other than their own work, that would just make sense. Uh, but for someone else's, it's just weird. Uh, but it all may be for naught, and I may, may be one of the people talking about the stuff that happens in the show, because the main male in this show is voiced by Yusuke Kobayashi. If you remember the dude, he was Subaru in ReZero, and he did a fucking 11 out of 10 job, so... It's the kind of voice actor that I had to follow them into any show and then drop if it was really shit, which is probably going to be the case. So I'll watch at least a couple episodes of this for Yusuke Kobayashi, but then I'll probably drop it because the show's probably not going to be to my taste. Even if it doesn't end up going in the weird directions I've heard, um, it, it, pro it just doesn't seem like the kind of show I'd be that interested in. But uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, next show we have is Minami Kamakura Koki Joshi Jutenshu Shabu. Fuck these long titles, bro. I should have looked up what the translation of this was. 
The story begins with Hiromi Mai Maiharu, a girl who moved from Nagasaki to Kamakura. She begins her new life in Kamakura and her first day in high school by bicycling to her school, but she has not ridden a bicycle since she was young. On the way to the ceremony for the first day, she meets Tomoe Akatsuki, and Tomoe helps her train to be better at bicycling. Um, this is an adaptation of a manga running, running since June 2011. That is the longest one we've listed yet, and may actually be the longest out of all the ones on this list. I think there might be one other that was longer, but I don't remember what it was. We'll see when we go through all these. Um, the director for this is Susumi Kudo, who mainly did stuff between, like, 2000 and 2010, like those shows. So I didn't really bother to list any, because they weren't even that popular of 2000 to 2010 shows, but just, like you know, generic stuff you would see in from 2000, 2010, not bad, not good, just like, okay. Um, but interestingly, interestingly enough, also directed K and more interestingly, at least for me, Magic Kaido 1412 or Magic Kaido Kid, because that's what the 1412 combines together to look like in the show. It, it the 1412 just lists kid. Anyways, uh, I liked Magic Kaido 1412 quite a bit, but not for the directing. Like, Honestly, the uh, the directing Magic Kaido was very straightforward. It was just like the stuff that happened in the manga as far as I'm aware of. I haven't read the manga, but it seemed very much like a very direct directing adaptation. There wasn't very too many creative liberties taken. And the more interesting side of Magic Kaido was the characters and the writing and uh, of the little stories and stuff like that. So not necessarily to give her credit for Magic Kaido 1412. Sorry. Uh, same with K. It's been a long time since I saw the first season, but uh, more interested in the art design than the actual directing. So, kind of like a generic director of, like, stuff happens in the show and there's no real, like, personal touch to much. Other than, like, just stuff being generic, if you want to call that a personal touch somehow. Uh, more interestingly, the scriptwriter did episodes for Cardfight Vanguard, Blood Plus, but also Dantalian no Shoka, which I talked about before, and a few Darker Than Black episodes. Uh, I didn't look up what the episodes were, but if you remember, Darker Than Black usually has, like, two to three episode long arcs. And the episodes that the writer did were 9, 10, uh, 17, 18, and then 24. So, I don't remember if what arcs 9 and 10 and then 17 and 18 were, but if you liked those arcs as far as their writing, then uh, maybe this is something you want to see. Um, but interestingly, uh, the most relatable probably... Uh, to this show, as far as script writing, is Yomushi Petal, even though from what I've heard, this show is nothing like Yomushi Petal. I just wrote, I just put, as I was doing notes, the most relatable is Yomushi Petal because bicycles. But Yomushi Petal was like a very straightforward, like, shonen sports manga. Whereas this seems more like a slice of life, not much happens uh, manga. I mean, it has bikes in it, but like, it's not really that much of a thing, as far as I'm aware of. So, there you go. Um... However, there to to note that there are there is some new blood VA in this. I wrote down uh, three of them are brand new. Uh, one of those three is doing a lead role, uh, the uh, Tamoy Akazuki role, which I believe, if I remember, is the dark blue haired one in the promo image. Uh, she's being voiced by someone named Yuki Hirose, who is again brand new, not even supporting roles before. Um, although important to note on a lot of the new blood VAs, especially with the female VAs, uh, sometimes they do hentai beforehand because it's very easy for them to get into hentai. Uh, thanks for that Twitter, by the way, if you got that picked up on the microphone. Um, the, uh, the, a lot of new blood, uh, VAs aren't credited for hentai. They do because they don't want it on their record. Uh, but that is more often than not where a lot of voice actresses, uh, especially, like I said, voice actresses, not the voice actors too, but more the case of the voice actresses, they start their work is in hentai. So, uh, again, even though I'm saying a lot of, um, I'll mention all the new blood VAs and like almost new VAs and stuff like that. Uh, they may not necessarily be new. They're just not credited with like pornographic stuff they've done. Um, they've done voices for, um, which doesn't mean that they have. I'm just saying it's a possibility. Um, just thought I'd mention that because uh, just fun fact, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but anyways, and, uh, another of the main roles, uh, did, uh, only three support, uh, this is going to sound confusing. Let me read this correctly. Another of the voice actresses who is not brand new, but I believe is doing a main role in this show has only done three supporting roles beforehand and was the lead in Shonen Maid. And that was it. Uh, so largely new VAs, two of the brand, uh, the two other brand new VAs were doing supporting roles. So I didn't bother to write too much about them. Uh, 
But again, just in general, there's some pretty new blood VAs in the show. 